Hello there, my fellow profit motivated friends, and welcome to some more Battletech lore. Although today's topic is pretty much standalone, I do believe it best fits in our famous characters miniseries. Now, if you're familiar with Battletech lore, you may have heard at some point of the infamous and mysterious Bounty Hunter. The character is a bit of a meme both in universe and outside the universe, although his history is far from a funny one. In fact, this character is so lore rich, I'm gonna make two videos on him instead of one. But for today, let us learn about his history and a few other facts, shall we? The Bounty Hunter is a mysterious figure who first appeared at the beginning of the 30th century. He, or she, or they, always appear to wear a fairly uncommon and thought to be experimental so-called PAL suit, where PAL stands for Power Armor Light. This suit obscured the wearer's identity just enough to allow the figure to remain unidentified to both employer and target, except of course by reputation. Always a mech warrior, the bounty hunter piloted a great variety of battle mechs, typically leading one battle mech lance. These mechs were invariably painted green with a currency symbol on it, a feared sight on the battlefield and often very custom made. While the actual origin of the bounty hunter persona is unknown, it is believed he or she is not just an individual but an entire organization. Although no one knows for sure when he actually started, the first stories of the bounty hunter emerged in the 2920s, when a masked individual piloting a green warhammer attracted fame for hunting down some of the most infamous mech warriors of the time. No one ever found out his name, but he quickly gained wealth and glory by cashing in many high value bounties. Stories about this guy defeating entire battalions by himself are probably ridiculous. There is one story about him, albeit unconfirmed, that he brought in the bodies of 29 men who robbed a bank on El Giza, and collected millions and millions in bounties offered by House Humphreys, and then millions and millions more by selling all their battle mechs. The man with the green warhammer would disappear from public view after collecting the El Giza bounties, and supposedly retiring afterwards. But three decades later, in 2957, a person, either in an environmental suit or full Starly Gear Up Mech Warrior combat suit, piloting a green warhammer, appeared again. And again he claimed the bounties on pirates preying upon the worlds of the Principality of Regulus. For the next two decades after that, the bounty hunter, as he or she actually became known, would travel across the inner sphere and the periphery, seemingly at random, but always tracking down the highest bounties of the time, and almost always bringing them in dead. The volume of stories and rumors about the bounty hunter would continue to rise, until a number of copycats also popped up, attempting to cash in on his name and reputation. The second bounty hunter, the one that appeared after the three decades absence, would also operate solo as before. But starting in the 2980s, he also began using a variety of battle mechs other than his trademark green warhammer, and also started to operate with a team of fellow mech warriors to assist him in taking down more lucrative contracts. Initially the teams were ad hoc formations that the bounty hunter hired as needed, but in the 2990s they had become a formal part of the operation, with four to six associates accompanying the bounty hunter in the same mechs, all of them using the same green paint and dollar symbols to adorn their mechs. Well, not dollars, sea bills, but you get the idea. This change in behavior was assumed to be an indication of another individual taking up the mantle of the bounty hunter. But it was also at this time that the image of the bounty hunter began to darken, as rather than continuing to target only criminals, he began to accept contracts for any warriors whose bounties were especially high, eventually accepting contracts to take down anyone, not only mech warriors, but generals, scientists, businessmen and engineers. Those looking up at the bounty hunter as a noble folk hero, the one man able to bring the worst of criminals to justice, now reviled him as a mere profit-driven mercenary hitman. 
The stories and the rumors about a bounty hunter would change from noble adventures to tales of a man even worse than those he tracked. One of the earlier stories of this incarnation of the bounty hunter portrayed him and his team landing on the Federated Sun's world of Marrakesson in 2996, and there he killed two generals of the Federated Sons who stood in their way. While making their way to the Draconis Combine to claim the bounties and carrying a cargo of AFFS mechs as salvage, they slipped onto the world of Leblanc, where they convinced a new and untested mercenary unit to give them safe passage to the Combine in return for arranging a contract. Yet, as soon as they entered Combine space, the bounty hunter and his team killed everyone belonging to the mercenary unit, selling their mechs and even their dropship. For the next two decades after that, the bounty hunters seemed to make a sport out of playing the great houses against each other. Between 2998 and 2999, many stories abounded in the Free Worlds League of the Bounty Hunter, tracking down officers and popular mech warriors, and then presenting their heads to the then-Colonel Katrina Steiner. However, in 3005, he turned on the Steiners and started hunting down Lyra nobility, politicians and officers. Maybe one of the most infamous stories in the legacy of the Bounty Hunter is his bitter feud with another celebrity, the famous Natasha Kerensky, or the Black Widow. The Green Marauder that the Bounty Hunter piloted after 3014 was in fact Natasha Kerensky's mech. In June of 3014, at the Marek Civil War, the Bounty Hunter operated alongside the Wolves Dragoons on Nova Roma to hunt down the loyalist of Janos Marek for Anton Marek's rebels. During a mop-up operation following the conquest of the planet, he signaled to Natasha Kerensky, who was then just a lieutenant in the Beta Regiment, that a certain ravine in the Dawn River region that he had inspected was safe. When Natasha's lands entered, they were ambushed and destroyed by the enemy, and Kerensky had to eject, being knocked unconscious. The remnants of her unit, namely her marauder, were salvaged by the bounty hunter, who would then go on to use it as the signature mech. They would clash again on Leblanc in October 3026. Details of the engagement are muddy, but reportedly Duke Michael Hasek Davion led Natasha into a trap laid again by the bounty hunter, reportedly as part of a scheme to use the captured Kerensky as leverage and force the dragoons to sign on with Hasek Davion. The ambush would fail, but not before the bounty hunter killed two of Kerensky's mech warriors out of spite. The final meeting between them saw them both temporarily allying on Bennett Free in 3027, when their respective owners left them both high and dry on a planet full of enemies. For lack of other options, they set aside their rivalry and joined forces and left the world together on Kerensky's dropship after the bounty hunter had seen to it that the critical tracking station was destroyed. After that, the bounty hunter disappeared from public view, although rumors had it that he fought as a free agent throughout the Fourth Succession War, accepting contracts from each of the great houses at various times. While some minor details do change as the persona changes, a few common facts do stay true no matter who is wearing the armor. The bounty hunter is first and foremost motivated by profit, but also by the challenge of accomplishing the impossible contracts and prove their abilities and enhance their legend. Although willing to take a calculated risk, they are not suicidal. Each contract will be extensively reviewed and researched and a detailed plan will be drawn up before taking any action. The bounty hunter is not sadistic, but they will do almost anything to accomplish the mission. If anyone stands between him and their target, innocent or not, they will not shy from destroying them. Although not capricious, those attempting to reveal his identity or to cheat him will usually be killed in short and brutal fashion. Typically, each bounty hunter maintains the persona for about a decade before passing the torch to a successor, including the signature mech, the dropship, and about one quarter of the war chest, and a manuscript known as the Tradition. This is a document that contains a tradecraft knowledge for bounty hunters and mech warriors alike, written by those who'd previously held the position. Generally, the bounty hunter will select the replacement from his closest associates, often grooming a protege and ultimate replacement. 
Other times he will sell the persona, or in more clan fashion, they will be killed and replaced by another pretender. If alive at the end of his career, the retiring bounty hunter usually goes on to live the rest of his life in rich anonymity. Since the beginning of the 30th century, the bounty hunter usually takes to the field with three to five associates. Each one of these an elite mech warrior, normally piloting the same green battle mechs with dollar symbols. The associates are recruited via multiple methods, either the bounty hunter drawing associates from family and close friends, or similar to the clan's concept of bondsman. With the bounty hunter offering positions to defeated enemies captured in combat, whom he believes have the right skills and mindset. The associates who hold a permanent place in the team are among those that the bounty hunter trusts implicitly, not just with his life, but also his identity and the history of the bounty hunter persona. Those who betray the trust will never live long to tell the tale. The members of the lands will receive generous shares in return for their loyalty, and often he will choose his successor from their number. Sometimes several of the old bounty hunter's close associates will retire when a new persona takes over the role. Other times the associates die in battle and leave the bounty hunter lands with an opening. When that happens, the bounty hunter usually either takes times off or takes smaller and less risky contracts until he can find a replacement to bring the lands up to full strength. The bounty hunter also has a very skilled technical team to keep all the mechs in perfect condition. Aside from being highly skilled, the technical team is also cross-trained in other skills, with each mech warrior, except for the bounty hunter himself, also expected to participate in the mech maintenance and repair. The chief tech is also the personal technician of the bounty hunter, and often a mech warrior who has previously served with the bounty hunter himself. None of the other techs knows the secrets of the bounty hunter. In fact, every time a new persona is adopted, the old technical staff is fired and a new one hired. And that, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the infamous, or famous, depending on who you ask, bounty hunter character from Battletech. Next time, we're gonna probably tell some stories of several different people who took on the role of the bounty hunter, as well as other mech warriors who were part of the operation. Nevertheless, quite an interesting character, or organization is probably the better word, which is apparently the mercenary mindset taken to the extreme. What about you though? Did you know about the bounty hunter? What are your thoughts on this character? Do share them in the comments below if you want. If you enjoyed the episode, please click the like, share and subscribe buttons for future content as well. Thanks a lot for watching and have an awesome healthy day.